Chairman Imhoff, Dr. Hargens, members of the board. Good I'm going to try to use my school voice if okay. I can with, uh, uh, without either over or underwhelming you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm honored to be here tonight and to represent Phi Delta Kappa International and Curriculum Management Systems Incorporated in presenting uh, the findings and recommendations of the Curriculum Management Audit that you engage us to perform. Tell you that it's been a humbling experience, and since August that I've slept, eat, and, and drink this audit. It's about all that's been on my mind, and uh, and I'm grateful to be here to report it. Not just because it brings conclusion, but because I think it will be a very helpful tool for Jefferson County Public Schools to as you build your plan and as you move forward in the future. In the beginning, I would like to acknowledge that the Board of Education, Superintendent Hargens, the district school-based employees are to be commended for the open and forthright manner in which they provided auditors access to district documents and personnel, parents and patrons for interviews. All requests were honored in a timely manner. Dr. Lynn Wheat and her staff worked tirelessly to ensure that auditors were provided everything necessary to complete this report. The quality of this report is greatly enhanced because of the hard work of your folks. I would just tell you that and recognize uh, their help. Interestingly enough, this, while this is a deficit report, we, we learned some things in our visit of your 156 schools and virtually all of the classrooms which we visited. And I put this here because I think it's important to kind of have a framework whereby you would understand the work of the audit says that even with their deep understanding of the challenges facing JCPS, auditors found after having visited the vast majority of the district's classrooms, no reason for public abandonment of their public school system. On the contrary, there is strong evidence of the board, administration, and public, public's firm determination to acknowledge deficiencies and work together to ameliorate them. And I would just tell you that that was a unanimous understanding of the 25 auditors. And we left the district with that, and even as we completed our reports, nothing changed that opinion. And so I just share that with you as well. The curriculum unity model suggests that we would have the best possible written curriculum for our students, that we would teach it with great fidelity, that we would test what we teach, and that when we do this, the student's achievement would be maximized. And it's our experience over an extended period of time in a number of districts that this is what happens. We're grateful to be here and to add insights to your district as you try to achieve what the vision of this model prov provides. We operate on the basis of six principles. And I would assure you that in this audit, all of those principles were strictly adhered to that we brought uh, very capable auditors. We had a number of lead auditors. All of the standard leads were, were very experienced. Uh, we have a principle of independence. We were not influenced unduly by anyone. We obviously talked to many people. And we believe that the object is an objective review. There is a consistency that you would find among many audits, and that was applied obviously here because we want it to be valid and reliable. Uh, principle of materiality, we do not include anything in terms of findings or recommendations of which there's not material substance to back it up. And finally, full disclosure. Uh, you will believe that when you understand that the audit is 540 pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the actual audit's 420 with the balance being in the appendices. But there is full disclosure. Uh, and as you read it, you'll understand that in a way it's a miracle. I mean, we left the third week in October, and we're back, and it's complete. So uh, it's, I, I'm grateful to be able to serve because it requires the best effort of everything that I do. Our sources of documents include, or sources of uh, data comes from documents. We would note to you that there have been 530 documents or categories, and when you include all the documents in individual categories, literally thousands of documents, anything that is printed on a piece of paper that would be usable, we've reviewed. We've also interviewed approximately 450 people, including yourselves, administrators, patrons, parents, teachers, and even students. 
and we have visited all of your sites. There were a few classrooms we did not go into because the teachers were having their prep period or there may be testing going on and we simply don't interrupt that. So we feel like that those data sources uh, have provided us with a deep understanding of the workings of the Jefferson County Public Schools. We divide the audit into five standards. Audit standard number one talks about the control of resources, programs, and personnel. Number two is all about curriculum. Do you have clear and valid objectives for your students? Number three is internal connectivity. Is everyone on the same page and is there rational equity among schools in the serving of students of various needs? I would define equity as not being equal. Equal would be very easy to achieve, frankly, because it would be a mathematical formula. Equity is much more difficult because it is a moving target, but it suggests that we try to distribute resources on the individual needs of students and of their schools. Number four is how do we use the results from the assessment data that we have to adjust, improve, terminate ineffective practices and programs. And number five is we look for productivity and ways in which productivity can be increased within the same financial constraints that you have. So those are the five standards. We have five findings in each standard with the exception of number five and we have four findings for a total there for a total of 24 findings. In addition, we have 10 recommendations, and I'll just briefly cover those. The conclusion of my report will give you the actual audit. Uh, that will be distributed, and then it will be placed on the district website for the public to review as well. <clears throat> there is a concept behind a deficit audit. Obviously, people expect us to do well. No one cheers when the train's on time. The underlying concept of the audit is that you don't have to be sick to get better. So I've been asked a number of times by a variety of people, well, how good or how bad? And that's really not the question that we want to answer. We want to answer about adequacy or effectiveness or those. And so that's in a range of degrees. And if we do not meet the standard, the audit standard, then we would say, that it is not yet adequate. That does not mean that some things are not present or does not mean that hard work hasn't been completed. It just means as it presently stands, it's not adequate at this point. Uh, and uh, that's true of many things in our lives, but, but what it does is also focus on those areas that we can improve. So it simply reports discrepancies and formulates recommendations to ameliorate them. The cost of the audit in, in both labor and your energies would not suggest that we come here to just give you an add a boy or an add a girl, but to actually come with some real help, and we believe that we have done that. There is a compelling reason for the audit, and the compelling reason uh, is kind of summarized in this quote from an elected official who said, the city of Louisville and Jefferson County cannot prosper without a strong public school system. I think we universally agree for that. So people have asked me, well, how does this audit really work? And if I could just simply use a medical analogy, I go for a wellness physical every year for compelling reasons. I live in a family of which my dad lived to be 100, but both of my grandfathers died of heart attacks. I have a sister who died at 52 of a heart attack. I've had two siblings with heart transplants. So you would think that I probably would be concerned about the genetic makeup that I carry about hearts. So I go to a doctor who's very good and he takes lots of tests and then we sit down just as I am sitting with you and he gives me a report. And he sometimes comments on what is needed for a lifestyle change and he also talks about medications. And he's very concerned about me and he doesn't pull any punches. Well, that's kind of where we are today. This is kind of your blood test and, and we're going to just report on it. It is not something that was done without thought. In fact, it's my understanding that the topic started really probably as early as last February, almost a year ago. And then when Dr. Hargens came and established the 90-day plan, goal one, strategy four, was to conduct this audit. And so it has been completed as was planned. We asked the district to give us the, the bottom line. Why do you really want to do this? And in this particular statement, it just simply says, we want to improve the support for student achievement. It's not, you're not compelled to do this. No one's requiring to you, it's self-elected. Uh, self and uh, the truth is, is that's probably best because then you have greater buy-in. 
and uh, not being compelled, but, but wanting to really get better. So that's the reason we understood that, and so we've come to help with those things. I need to just simply share this with you because the world has changed even in the last 10 years. With NCLB's arrival, suddenly we have centralized testing and we are judged on the basis of that centralized testing. If we have that, then that requires that we have a centralized curriculum. Because if you teach kids stuff that they're not tested on or you don't teach them what they're going to be tested on, that's not fair. There is no research to support that kids do better when you don't teach them what they're going to be tested on. That may seem silly, but the truth is you have to have a centralized curriculum if there's going to be a centralized test. We want that to be a tight fit. However, what also we need is that teachers need a wide variety of tools to teach that tight curriculum. So for instructional effectiveness, there needs to be a variation based upon individual student needs. So there needs to be differentiated instruction. That is a looser fit. So when we put all of that together, that's what we kind of look for, is does the district have a centralized curriculum? So finding 1.1, and I would tell you that perceptions for the people who hold them represent their truth. And the other truth, I believe, is that if you want a perception to change, you have to ex change the experience of the person who has the perception. By changing the experience, then the perception will change. And so the perceptions that we found when we came to do this audit is, and that's of school personnel and the public, shows that there is a lack of trust in the district's ability to effectively design and deliver a high quality curriculum to students. There is some irony in that because while we found the perception, we found that there were some other disconnects. So I add a little bit of detail. JCPS schools are generally better than the public thinks. We were in them. Nobody put a show on for us. I've been in thousands of classrooms. School was in session. People of goodwill were earnestly trying to help kids. So that's where there is a disconnect. Then another thing that is interesting is that by and large, JCPS is governed through oral traditions. How we determine that is we simply ask the question, what is your source of direction when you need it? Well, I go talk to somebody, and where is their source? Well, they talk to somebody, and what's their source? Well, they talk to somebody. So what we want to see is that, we, is that there are, are well-written policies that people subscribe to and go to as for source documents and administrative regulations. The dilemma is not that the information that people are sharing is particularly bad, but it simply creates a system of schools versus a school system. That's the dilemma. So you're going to find in recommendations, all of them, an invitation for the board to pay very deliberate attention to policies. And in some cases, we're very, very specific. Others are more general. But you will be able to work with Dr. Hargens and the staff to come up with those policies that provide that first source direction that people need. Uh, there's another one, if you look at the, the last bullet, that there was a concern in reality in which that uh, there was some conflict between the, the school-based folks and the district folks. We didn't find that. We didn't find it. Maybe there's, there's some that are a little more independent than others, but the truth is the school-based folks know that they need a strong central support system and that I have been on audits where we have had a finding that school-based leadership didn't work, but here we don't have that finding, so we just share that with you. So when we look at all of those things, this is going back to what is tightly held and what is loosely held. We want a system A with a tight curricular focus and with differentiated instructional practices. What we find universally in curriculum audits really though is B. And B is, is that there's a wide variety of programs going on and there's a very narrow uh, instructional delivery system. And the truth is, is you fit B. You do. Uh, not perfectly, it's not a perfect match, but what we're going to try to do as we share this information with you is help you understand what it takes to become an A-type system. And as we've worked with administrators today, my sense is, is they have that growing understanding and, and through the course of following the recommendations that will occur. 
a little more detail. One of the challenges you have is that in finding 5.4, we notice that there's over 800 programs reported on district on uh, individual building surveys. That's more than any system can really manage. And so over the years, there's been an accumulation. And there hasn't really been an evaluation to determine or inform the administration or the board as to whether the program should be continued, refined, or terminated. So you're going to find lots of recommendations to the audit that says we need to do that level of evaluation in order to determine the efficacy of given programs. You also have lots of data. And the data that we gathered shows that there are a few institutional barriers. For example, we noticed that the least experienced teachers were at the teaching in the most high-risk schools and that two-thirds of those teachers who requested transfer were transferring from a high-risk school into a, a school of less risk. Uh, we understand why that's occurring and we would just suggest that you look at that and maybe there needs to be some incentives or other arrangements which we make sure that we create a balance that provides, you know, every teacher uh, wants to be competent and every school wants to be filled with competent teachers and so we provide what level of competency we have among the schools. You honored 51 teachers tonight, how wonderful. Uh, that's probably more than we have in the state of Idaho in terms of <laughs> national board <laughs> certification. But, you know, nevertheless we want to be able to distribute that talent among the schools. And then the last one is probably the dilemma of all dilemmas. And that is you have been asked to be superhuman in meeting the demands and the needs of, of society and of schools. So there are challenges with almost conflicting demands. So we have reported that the district has not been able to fully honor diversity, provide a consistent and equitable education, and at the same time provide school choice in an autonomous school-based decision-making model. This isn't the military, this is a democracy. And you have to listen to your constituents. And if you didn't have school choice, you would lose market share. And you would lose a lot of, in, in, uh, of leadership that's being developed among your students that will eventually fill your community and your state and really the nation and the world with talent. That's a real challenge and as you work through everything you're going to do with all the reports you receive, that's the juggling act that you have to pay attention to. My sense is, is that you work together and there will be a little give and take and sometimes a tightening, sometimes a loosening, but you will find that balance and it will become rational and the people will accept it as the best effort of what we can do given the resources we have. So I'm not discouraged by that task, I just sense that it's one of the big tasks. <clears throat> so finding 1.2 is really about board policies. And it's very lengthy, and we've embedded lots of information so that it will help guide the district as you continue to develop those policies. Finding 1.3 is about planning, and you do have plans, and there's quite a bit of planning. What we would suggest is, is that we get them all together, that we unify them, get everybody on the same page, and we would like the plans at the local site and the district plans to be first cousins. And likewise on policies, we would like the school-based policies and the board policies to be first cousins so that there is some unanimity there. Finding 1.4 is about job descriptions. It's kind of an interesting quandary because we found your job descriptions met audit standards for the most part. But because of their generic nature, they are not as useful as possible. So in recommendation one, you're going to see where we are recommending that all job descriptions be rewritten with a level of specificity that gives the employee a very clear target about what their responsibilities are, how and when they need to get things done, and then the evaluation process evaluates that employee against his or her job description. It's our sense that that, that will dramatically increase uh, the comfort of the employee because they'll have a clear target but also increase production. Finding 1.5 is the basis for the recommendation that we released in November. It's not customary that we would do that but given the enormity of the task in terms of creating an organization and then uh, 
reassigning people to various positions that you needed the Head Start, so we did release it. The level two uh, organizational review that you had from Dr. English and Dr. Poston was also a result of this particular finding and, and the need to go into depth. And so you now have both the finding, you have the organizational review, and it's my understanding that you've posted a number of positions and you're proceeding to, uh, to work on completing the recommendations that are found, uh, the specific recommendations that are found in the broad recommendation number one. As we move into standard two, which is all about curriculum, I need to put a framework around the whole audit and the theory behind the audit. So if we talk about underlying the curriculum, this is what it looks like. We have teachers who are teaching really hard 100% of the time. The dilemma is, is if the written curriculum doesn't match that, then this is what you see. However, what's even more challenging is here's the typical test. And you are not unique in that because states don't release <coughs> test items. You know, in Idaho, a teacher can't even be present when the kids are taking the test, so they can't even look over the shoulder of the students. They sign a document that says, I've done nothing to learn about the test that I have to teach my kids to prepare my kids for. There's a little challenge for all of us. And then this is complicated by the challenge that schools now are on the Common Core, which you've just barely adopted as a state, so your curriculum folks are in transition from one set of standards to another set of standards and yet we come in and we take a picture in a certain week and report on that picture. So the transition creates the complication. But this is where we want to go. Here's an aligned curriculum. Teachers are still teaching very, very hard. But there's the written curriculum, and we follow an 80-20 rule, which means that we should not consume more than 80% of teaching time with the written curriculum so that teachers have time for reinforcement and enrichment. And in all of the places I've worked and followed through on, I've never found that there's been a pushback on that ratio. That seems to be very rational. And here's the test. And I can just promise you that if students are taught what they're going to be tested on, that they'll do better. There's no research to refute that. Uh, so that is the goal of the curriculum management audit. It's very complex work. As we have worked with administrators, my sense is that they have a growing understanding. There will be additional support and training as they need it. Uh, they've been proactive in terms of getting the book, in of the curriculum management book, and working through that. So they're doing some self-teaching. So I think that they'll get there. Because here's the compelling reason why that's so important. Without alignment, this is what happens. There's four variables that will always predict how students do. These are pretty universally true and they've been with us for many decades. Number one is the education of parents. Number two is the number of parents at home. Two parents provide one more teacher than one parent. Three is the type of community. If children are surrounded by this academic focus and they see people going to school and succeeding and then on to the university and earning degrees, it just becomes an automatic thing that's expected in their lives. If they don't have those models, then it's a different experience. And ultimately, poverty, which is measured in this report as the percent of students who are on free and reduced lunch. So if we don't have a deeply aligned curriculum, then that's what's going to determine achievement, not the instruction or other things. Well, our goal is, is to not have that be the variable. What we want them to be is a tightly <coughs> held curriculum taught with great fidelity, given the students' resources that they need. Let me give you just a, a personal example. In the school district that I'm currently serving as a superintendent, and I'm in a part-time role there, we have 30% minority population that's primarily represented by first-generation immigrants. Most of them, English is their second language. In the past, we've had just the proficiency model, and the school has been on AYP watch for years. The schools have been. Well, this year, because of how we're now focusing on growth, 
we've asked all teachers that uh, of grades three and up to have a pretest and then a post test. Well, the district, the teachers have constructed it. We've had some outside help to advise us in terms of are we doing the right thing. In the course of this time, we've been through one term, and the teachers were static about the growth of the kids. They grew 45 percent. This high school kids grew 45 percent in this term from the pretest to the post test. That's wonderful. The average was 77 percent. So you take 45 percent from that, and you know that the kids obviously were in a failing category as they entered the class. But we wanted them to have curriculum where they had to learn. We had some students who had zero on the pretest and scored 55 percent on the post-test, which in a normal world would be an F. So the teachers were starting to fill out the report cards, and suddenly they came to this and they said, time out. These kids grew 55 percent. The class average was 45 percent. They outgrew everybody. Are we still going to give them an F? A new paradigm appeared. No, we're going to give them more time. We're going to give them credit for everything they've done and then invite them to continue. So we restructured the schedule. We put additional supports in. We honored what they're doing. And I, and I would tell you that the kids are excited because they see light at the end of the tunnel and they know the support's going to get there. So it's a different paradigm when you start working with a deeply aligned curriculum that gives the kids the support they need. Now, I know that's a minor example in a minor school, but nevertheless, it's a correct principle. So as we move into standard two, which is curriculum, the first part is, what is the blueprint of your overall curriculum plan? And we found that you don't fully have that in place. There's an explanation for that. The curriculum of yesterday was mostly buying a textbook and having a teacher teach it with no high-stakes test. Well, with the high-stakes test, we now have to be more sophisticated, and so this is a maturing process that's going to take place, not just here, but all across the nation. And so the blueprint will be written, I'm sure. Number two is how much written curriculum do you have? And we found that at the elementary level that you have an adequate amount, but there needs to be more done at the middle and high school. And the reality is the, the elementary is going to have to redo theirs to accommodate the common core. So there's some work to do there. Number three, what is the quality of the curriculum guides you have? It wasn't zero, but it didn't meet our high standard of proficiency. And so now the curriculum folks have a vision of what good curriculum documents look like. And as they write them in the future, they'll follow the template and my guess is that it'll be embraced by teachers because it will be so helpful for them. Let me give you just a couple of examples. One is we have the objective we want students to learn, and over here is a sample test item of how that objective might be test, tested. In addition, here are the resources teachers can use to teach the objective, and here are some teaching strategies that might be helpful, even including how technology might be applied. So when I'm a teacher building my lesson plan, suddenly I have all of these supports versus simply a textbook that I'm to teach from and not really knowing what the assessment looks like. So as those guides mature and as they are given, my sense is teachers will embrace them because they'll see they're helpful. Then they'll give this, the curriculum writers some feedback and so that can be tweaked in kind of a constant manner where we are constantly monitoring and self-correcting. Number four is how do the documents, the curriculum documents teachers actually work with? And we found that there's some challenges there, that there's not yet specificity or feasibility, and it's, there's not necessarily congruent alignment. And so we've given some suggestions in the recommendations, and we've pointed out where these disparities are, and it's one more thing that curriculum writers will be able to do as they move forward. As teachers build their understanding of what deeply aligned curriculum is, then they'll know how to teach that better, just as the high school teachers in the district I serve. Number five is a little different. There's two parts to number five. The first part is, is the curriculum the teachers are teaching on grade level with some district expectation. In other words, are first graders getting first grade curriculum and third graders getting third grade curriculum? Well, we found that first graders were. We also found that 10th graders were in Algebra 2. We found a whole different, uh, a variety of different things in between. 
where sometimes it was below grade level. So one of the challenges is to have a curriculum pacing guide in a curriculum map which lays out this articulated curriculum, pre-K all the way through grade 12, and ensure that we have these benchmarks that students know about, that teachers know about, that they can hit to keep us on grade level. And then when we have students who can exceed that, we need to have a plan for them, and then we ha need to have a plan for the students who got 55% in which they can continue to grow. And all of that can kind of develop simultaneously. The second part is what we call cognitive type. That's, are they higher level skills, are they lower level skills, and it's not that lower level means not good skills, but are they all about recall and comprehension and maybe some application, or do we get to the higher thinking skills of analysis and synthesis and evaluation and creativity? Well, our experience as we drew from all of these artifacts that we pulled is that by and large they're recall and comprehension, and so our invitation is to find ways to move kids into higher thinking activities. As we move to finding three, it's about consistency and equity. And I would tell you that one of the great challenges is equity, and we found that there are some inequities in access to comparable programs, services, learning opportunities. Resource, resources are allocated in a different way based upon needs, but then sometimes that's ameliorated and neutralized because a given school can raise so much in fundraising while other schools can't. And so there has to be some kind of a balance. We're just inviting you to relook at that and see if we can make sure that we're doing what our intentions are. Uh, this is 3.2 is all about professional development. In every recommendation, there is a professional development piece. We have to retool. In the last professional development uh, conference I had with my staff, I titled it Retooling for Teacher and Student Success. It was all about the common core, how it's going to roll out, how we're going to respond to it, and how we have to rewrite our curriculum documents, including lesson plans and ultimately tests to match the common core. It was a wonderful day, and people understand that professional development is ongoing. Next year in our calendar, we have built a whole week in which teachers will be together while they're harvesting Idaho potatoes and the kids are in the fields working on that. So lots of ways to, to get it done. 3.3 is about instruction. And what we found is that, and some of this is due to your school-based model, but some of it is because we just have not intentionally designed an instructional model and spread it throughout the district. The state has adopted what is called the Cheadle Principles, Characteristics of Highly Effective Teaching and Learning. I've read through them, there's nothing that I would disagree, but they are the theory and we have to flesh that out so that there's a transfer from theory to practice. That's what will have to happen with teachers and principals, your coaches, is how do we get those so that there's a level of automaticity and teachers just automatically know how to use those principles really in every circumstance they encounter. 3.4 is about how do principals supervise and, and how are we monitoring to ensure that the curriculum is being taught. We found that it's going on, but it's not formalized and that the con feedback is not particularly consistent. And so the finding kind of details how that is. There's a lot of models and there's some really good things happening, but that's not consistently being applied. 3.5 then is all about evaluation of both the building principal and of the teachers and of its efficacy. And our experience is, is that the instruments that you're using for evaluation are fine, but it's how they are being applied. And again, there's some inconsistency, and it doesn't always focus on growth. So when I evaluate the people I'm responsible for, I'm just going to give them uh, a gardening metaphor. This is the day we apply fertilizer. It's not the day we're weeding, it's the day we apply fertilizer because you apply fertilizer to your garden to ensure it grows. So we have a little bit of miracle grow in the evaluation process. Uh, 4.1 is how do we use the test results we get and how do we build that? And 4.1, just like 2.1, we would expect that there would be a plan for all of the assessments and that there would be an assessment calendar and everything would be fully understood and it would be very intentional. We found that it's evolving, that, there, that it is there, but it still is evolving and it's not as comprehensive as it probably needs to be. 
and it doesn't provide enough direction for program evaluation so that we can get the results we want. And so again, there will have to be a blueprint that will be built. 4.2 says, is there enough assessment? Is there enough written assessment? And the answer is yes and no. And the finding head kind of describes that part which is adequate and that part which needs to still have some work. And then the reality is, is all of the formative tests that districts put together is going to have to be modified to adapt to the Common Core. Again, we're in that transition phase. Finding 4.3 talks about specific formative, like benchmarks, and summative, like the end of course assessment or the state test. Uh, that data is really available, but there is not yet a system, and, and this is universally true in almost all states. We have more data than we know how to manage, and so there needs to be a system in which we organize that, put it at the fingertips of the principal and the teachers, so the teachers don't have to do an inordinate amount of work, and that they have all the data they need to make really good judgments. It's available, we're getting there. I think that the folks who are responsible for it recognize kind of where they are and where they need to go. Uh, but you have to have that data if you're going to make good decisions as a board. In absence of it, then we're still kind of hoping for or making our best guesses. 4.4 isn't going to be new information for you, but it may be presented in a way you haven't seen before. It's all about the student data. It's what appears on all the state reports and it's, and it's what the the press picks up to report on those schools that are high performing and not so high performing. But we present it in a different way that will help you kind of understand where the gaps are and how long it may take to close those gaps. And we do that on the basis of eth ethnicity and also of other kind of subgroups like uh, free and reduced lunch and, and uh, special education and other things. So as you look at that report, you will see there's some gaps. And the only way we're going to close those gaps is to have a deeply aligned curriculum. That's just, that's the only possible suggestion we can give you. Number five is uh, the evaluation of programs. I would tell you that this is an emerging uh, skill set and technology in all schools. Uh, it's demanded because of the public's cry for accountability we have to answer the question, so what? And we use program evaluation to guide that. And so when we adopt a program, we want to have, uh, we want to have a discipline approach to doing it, then we want to evaluate that, we want to implement it with fidelity, and we want to make sure that there's a cost benefit to what we're doing. So we may be spending X number of dollars, but what benefit do we get from it by spending it? And that's where program evaluation comes in. And as we mature as school systems in this new information age, this will be a skill set that will become very, very important. Uh, you have people, I think, that they will build those skills and the data will become more user friendly as time goes on. We get into standard five, which is all about productivity. And we would tell you that you have been really blessed and for the most part, because of the generous way that Kentucky uh, permits your school district to be funded, that you, for the most part, have missed the recession. It's also somewhat a function of careful planning on the part of the board, the administration, over an extended period of time to provide that kind of stability. That's really good news. The way you budget is somewhat traditional and formula driven. We have a recommendation that allows you to get extremely specific in terms of establishing priorities and making sure that funds go to the highest priority. And in the end, it's a, it's a system that if you wish it to, can allow you to know what you don't fund and what drops out the bottom. So you make sure your dollars are going to where they're going, going, to, where they're going to have the greatest impact. We have been forced in Idaho along with most states to really find out what's important because our funds have been cut over four years substantially. And uh, this year they say that they may increase them by a net amount of 1%, and that's helpful, but they've been cut 10.2% over the previous four years. And so we've used most of our reserves, we've, we've slimmed down our staffs, we've done just a number of things, and now we know what's really important. In a board meeting very much like this, uh, this month on January 5th, I 
I reported on, on how many fewer positions we had and what other reductions we had made. And I said, we are just simply much leaner than we've ever been. But because we've implemented all of these other things, one board member leaned over and says, but we're a lot better. So money doesn't always equate to success, but money well spent and well placed, and over time, that success comes. 5.2 are about facilities. And, and we would commend you because I've been in many situations where facilities have been a huge finding, a major finding. In the, for the most part, yours is adequate and uh, can meet your existing population. There are some challenges because of the present student assignment. You have some overcrowded facilities because schools of choice. You have some that are underutilized. There are a few situations that we have pointed out in the audit where there needs to be some maintenance taken care of. Those are relatively minor and can be addressed with some planning and some effort. Uh, but they're very clean. Uh, truth is, is, is they're, they're hygienically as good as we've ever seen and they're safe places for kids to be. So uh, uh, almost a commendation on, on facilities. But it does address the issue of uh, you know, you, you have enough seats, it's how you're going to organize yourself to use the seats you have. Number three is about technology, and technology is an interesting creature because a year ago, I don't know if I had understood the iPad phenomenon and all of, it, and all of its cousins. And now there's an iPad 2, and I don't have an iPad 1. And my wife, just so embarrassed for me that I don't have one, she said, I could get you one for Christmas if you really wanted it. And I said, well, I've really got to get through this audit before I want anything. <laughs> so maybe my reward is that I'll get an iPad. Uh, we found your teachers to be pretty tech technologically savvy. and We found teachers using technology for instructional purposes. However, we didn't find many students using technology, and we have data that kind of shows that. On our walkthroughs, we just collected those data. So most of the technology is teacher-centered, uh, and, then, and then what's happening uh, is not always coordinated at various levels. Sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing because of the school-based decision-making model. Schools will do things that the central office isn't always fully aware of. And then the impact isn't fully understood because now we have all of these machines, but we don't necessarily have a place to plug them all in. So there's a lot of factors about this. And then I think that technology, we're just beginning to understand its influence on instruction. And so that's going to emerge. What we're suggesting is that you make unified, deliberate, kind of intentional decisions as it relates to technology and its role. It's not that there is a serious lack. It's that how is it used and what is my understanding and how am I going to do that. That might require some more professional development for really folks at all levels. Uh, it's not in a crisis state a, at all, but it's in something that you look at in the context of your planning, in the context of your budgeting, and so you see what the ultimate goal is and then you work towards that. 5.4 is a revisit of the program. We, we told you in 4.5 how to evaluate them, but in 5.4, it points out the dilemma that the district has. Over 800 program titles, not all of them are academically. It may be an intervention like Big Brothers or Big Sisters, but it's still something that requires space and time and energy. My humble experience after 36 years is that there is initiative fatigue among educators. It, it's hard to be up to speed on so many things so often. So sometimes less can be more. And when you really get a full plate and you want to put something else on it, you probably need to take something off of lesser value. And the program evaluation piece allows us to make those decisions and this just simply says you got a lot of them. And in fact, you have my record. If John Murdoch gave a record for the most programs, JCPS would get the record. Uh, you're a big district, so it's understandable. The school-based model adds to it. 
Uh, but somewhere, sometime, that has to be part of the variable that we get our arms around these programs. Uh, it's not bad to have stuff, but it's kind of like my house. We live in a modest-sized house that's really adequate, but it's just really full of stuff. <laughs> and we really need to go down to the thrift store with a truck. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what you need to do with your programs, is to find out the ones you really aren't using or don't need, and then, and then kind of sift through them and keep what's important. So those are the 24 findings. As we move into the recommendations, you've had recommendation one now since the first week in November, and you have been responding to that. It essentially is, is to reorganize, uh, to do the level two analysis, which you've done, and to prepare and adopt a set of quality job descriptions, which will be in process as you hire these various people. So you're well on your way. And in fact, you might ask yourself, how does all of this other stuff get implemented in really the very same way as you're doing number one. You're identifying what needs to be done, assigning it, and moving forward. Number two is about policies. This will engage you as a board uh, probably more than most of the recommendations because you ultimately have to approve them. I personally was trained by a man by the name of Ed Hill and I found the power in having direction through policy. He taught me that, and then I practiced it all of the years in my central office. There is great protection for everyone to have policies. It gives permission for people to do their work, and it tells them what is important, and it tells them how. The big debate in where I am is that parents wanted their kids home from ball practice earlier. And there was a conflict between the coach who wanted the kids forever and the parents who would like them to come home sometime. <laughs> the board said, what are we going to do? And I said, policies work. Well, what should the policy say? So we've had lots of discussion. We've talked to parents. We've talked to coaches. I've kind of pushed and forged what I believe is going to be the compromise. The first reading has been held, and the second reading is February 9th. And I'm just curious as can be of what's going to happen. But if we have it and people follow it, that issue then will be settled and we can really use time on things that are more important. Now, as mundane as that may seem in our little district, it has consumed way more time than it justifies. So policy provides direction. So you'll get a chance. And then also, we would like your school-based policies and your district policies to be first cousins. Don't necessarily have to be brothers and sisters, but they at least ought to be first cousins. Number three is also going to involve you as you redesign the planning process and create a coherent, focused in, uh, plan for improvement that puts everybody and everything on the same page. And you already have the model for that in Dr. Hargan's 90-day plan and beyond. You really have that model. It just needs to now be three and four years. Is that OK to say, Dr. Hargan's? <laughs> <laughs> Number four is all about curriculum. And if you read the five findings and this rather lengthy recommendation, it will give step-by-step -step processes to get this deeply aligned curriculum. It's a very doable task. It's very labor intensive and requires a great amount of discipline on the part of many people. But it's very doable. Uh, I just bring you back to the reason we do that is because we want a central focus curriculum that's tightly held and that's the reason we need that. So we want a system A, the curriculum recommendation gets you there. Number five is how we're going to handle assessments and program evaluations. And again, it takes step by step so that we have a good match between the written curriculum and the tested curriculum. That's really what number five is, and that we have data to evaluate all of these 800 programs. Number six is about instruction. There needs to be a JCPA way. And that needs to be broad and flexible so teachers can differentiate. And my sense is, is that will emerge over time. The Cheadle principles, those that are provided by the state, will provide the theory. And now we have to move theory into practice. Much professional development can occur around the theme of instruction. Number seven is how are principals going to monitor instruction to ensure that that well-written curriculum is being taught with fidelity. And we have. Uh, a recommendation that you require procedures for monitoring 
and that we promote that kind of consistency and we provide the training to everyone that's needed. Number eight is about professional development. We're going to recommend that you have one person who's the gatekeeper. The reason for that is sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing and we don't know if it's effective. So with that person, the director of professional <coughs> development, you'll be able to have that person work under the chief academic officer, coordinate activities with the six assistant superintendents, with the curriculum department so that we have on time and quality professional development occurring where it's needed. And I have observed that occur. Probably the most complex was Bering Strait, Alaska, because they have hundreds of miles between their sites. Almost everything is done online. And yet, those teachers have high quality professional development that they can get in their individual schools uh, from a menu of very helpful things. And so, when that becomes a priority, it just happens and, and you have enough creativity among your folks and the people that you might bring in from the outside to get that done. Number nine is probably the, the one that's challenged to keep all the balls in the air, where you're trying to meet the demands of choice and create equity and, and honor diversity. And so we have some suggestions uh, in terms of how to provide that equal access, how to eliminate that achievement gap that's present, and then to take some further steps, not that you're not taking steps, but some further steps to ensure that resources are allocated on the basis of student needs. Uh, it's a demanding recommendation. And it's one that I don't know that we ever get perfect on, but we can get close enough for practical purposes. And I believe the people will support your best efforts. I, I just do. Uh, it's been my experience over a long time. People want you to succeed and that they recognize that, while we may fall short of perfection, we've given it our best shot. Number 10 brings everything together under the canopy of the money you spend. We know what you value by what you spend your money on. And so when you spend it on those things that you value the most and you make sure through very intentional decisions that you're spending it there, then you're going to get the results that you want to have. When we spend money by tradition or because that's how we have done it, then sometimes it isn't as good as if we really think about it. So we have recommended a three-year plan, it may even take a little more, to move to a program-based budget. And in that concept, there may be some things that you stop funding because they are no longer a high priority, or that you fund differently or at different levels. And there may be some things that you fund more because they have become a higher priority. The, the San Diego School District invited us to come in and we only had one assignment on that particular audit and that was they wanted to answer this question. They had to cut millions and millions, 81 million I believe, out of their budget that year and they wanted to know if they could cut out their curriculum department and if it would have any impact. That was a great question. I happened to be the guy that had to go in and look at the money. What is interesting is that curriculum department was costing them about $3 million a year at that particular point in time. So we did an item analysis match between the release date items on the state test and the textbooks because it was the conclusion of some of the proponents of getting rid of the curriculum department that if we just teach the textbooks, our kids are going to be okay. Guess what the percentage of match was between the content of the, the textbook and what the kids were being taught? 61%. Pretty uniform in all the core areas. Well, the curriculum department was charged with filling in the 39%. And they really had a good department. I mean, one that was honestly trying to do their best. So we wrote the report, and we just simply said, you can cut it, but it would be like eating your seed corn. There is a consequence to what you fund, what you don't fund. Recommendation 10 helps provide focus for that. Interestingly enough, they didn't cut that. They didn't cut the curriculum department. They found their cuts in other ways. And to this day, while they have pared everything down, they still have a viable curriculum department. And it came back to a very intentional decision that that's important. So just a summary, just a brief summary of recommendations. Number one, reorganize administrative services and reconfigure personnel. 
write job descriptions. And number two is review, revise, adopt, and implement your board policies that will provide for the first source information that people need for direction. Number three is redesign your planning, put everybody on the same page, get the school-based plans and the district plans together. Number four is the curriculum piece. It's very complex, you're in transition, but you can get there. Number five is the same for student assessment and program evaluation. Six is get an instructional model that people buy into, that they can utilize so that when teachers teach, they are confident they're using best practices and they have practiced those to the level of automaticity so that it just happens automatically as they teach this high quality curriculum that you're going to prepare. Seven is that we prepare principals and teachers for effective monitoring practices so that teachers are comfortable as the t principals do their walkthrough and that they know that I'm going to be evaluated fairly and the targets are very clear and I can meet the objectives and the expectations of the district. Number eight, is to have this professional development program support everything else. Number nine is to seek ways to establish and increase equity where you possibly can. Number 10 is to fund it with, with uh, money going to your highest needs and managing that in a way that gets you the product that you want to have. I would tell you that we try to balance the demands of the audit on the basis of the capacity of the system to follow it and we didn't cut you any slack. <laughs> because, oh, I'll get to because in a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna share a moment with you on understanding change because you're in the middle of change and I think it's critical to understand it. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but Who Moved My Cheese, but it was about That's some good. mice that had a regular <laughs> supply of cheese and sud suddenly they ran out. And so they showed up and what are they to do? Well, there were some people who hung around and complained and some mice that went and found new cheese. Well, you're kind of in that position. There's a lot of cheese out there, but it's been relocated. So I'm going to just take you through one model that has proven to be very helpful to me. It would not surprise me if the feeling who, the people who are affected most by this audit and the level two organizational review have a feeling of denial. There's no need to change. I can't imagine why you've invited these folks to come in and disrupt my life. And that can certainly be followed by anger. If you've ever had a personal loss, then you can understand why anger sometimes occurs. And you feel that there's been great injustice and that there's been unfairness. I would honor those feelings because they're really natural. And, uh, and we want to take care of the people and have empathy as we move along. Step three is an interesting step because it's what you do with the audit. It's where you negotiate what the new JCPS is going to look like. It's when Dr. Hargens brings her report back to you and she works with her staff and that negotiation comes in terms of, of these 10 recommendations <coughs> and all of their subcomponents, what's most important and how are we going to proceed. As we reorganize ourselves and, and we reconfigure staffing, how does that look? And people during this time is they're going to start looking at not what does the new JCPS look like, but what must I do? The recommendations will really help you create the forum for negotiations. Negotiations can't go on forever. You have to eventually have what you're going to do to change. And so that's the actual point of implementing the agreed upon changes. In change theory, there's an unfreezing. Typically, there's a triggering event that causes that to occur. You might say that the audit is that triggering event. My sense is that's not true. My sense is that the triggering event occurred before we came. And it may have been because of your public wanting to have something in which is a little different. You have responded in a very responsible way. You've been transparent, you've been forthright, you've done the very best you can to bring people who are knowledgeable, have an understanding of where you are, and to help you have recommendations to move forward on. So the unfreezing has occurred. The reality is, is you can't stay unfrozen forever. 
So the negotiation part is very helpful because as you begin to refreeze, you want to have the components there that will help you be successful. But you don't want to refreeze as hard as you probably were before because you want to be able to self-monitor and self-correct. That's where program evaluation really comes to play. Then finally the change occurs and then there will be acceptance on the part of the personnel and of the public that says, this is a hard work, but I can do it. And the confidence will come. And children will be blessed in ways that you can not imagine. Just in ways you cannot imagine. On an individual basis and collectively. And then the perception that people have will change because their experience will have changed. I just believe that. I've seen it happen over and over. So, even with our deep understanding of the challenges you face, we found after everything we have done, no reason for public abandonment of their public school system. I would be happy to have my grandchildren come here. On the contrary, there is strong evidence on the, your part, on the part of the administration, and the public, this firm determination to acknowledge deficiencies and to work together to ameliorate them. I just, I, I believe that with every part of my being. Uh, I've been told that I'm a zealot and that I have great passion but I think I have perspective as well. This is not some, some fad that fades. This is about basic principles of curriculum development in terms of designing and delivering it, that if there's a discipline that you follow, can be present for generations to come. But you need good policies you need something that will maintain the intellectual capital and heritage so that each generation can work and improve and update. But you've got a great beginning here. And then finally, the auditors wanted this in the audit. It is sincerely hoped by the Jefferson County Public School District's curriculum management audit team that this report will provide the stimulus for the board, administration, teachers, and community to take stock of their present situation and unite together to accomplish these very doable tasks. The audit team is optimistic that given proper attention to the areas requiring improvements in the district, as cited by this audit, the expectation of the board and professional staff for further betterment of a system will be met. The curriculum management audit will provide direction on how to continue to develop and maintain the focus that is necessary for maximizing student learning and for closing the achievement gap among students and schools as well as challenging those students who already demonstrate high levels of performance. And they wanted to join me in extending to you our best wishes. So that's my report. I would stand for questions or uh, let you have all 546 pages. <laughs>